Hello and welcome to worship whenever you have a chance to view this. I'm recording this on Friday. Again, I'm uncertain with, you know, things with my mom and I really appreciate your prayers. So does my, my dad and my sister, but I wanted to get this recorded so at least we'll have an option if I'm unavailable on Sunday morning. So we are in John's Gospel, chapter 13 today. And so I'd invite you to turn to that as we travel along today. It's the account of the foot washing. Normally, we see this text during Holy Week, Monday, Thursday. I'll mention that here in just a bit. But I like how our narrative lectionary places it. Right here, smack dab in the middle of Lent. And honestly, for such a time as this in our world where love needs to prevail, right? Sorry, I'm having some microphone troubles here. So if you're tuning in via Facebook, I'll have some clips on my Facebook page too that you can uh, view as part of our message for today. Let me pray us in. Lord Jesus, we just come before you and our world is just a mess, and you know that. You told us that in this world we will have trouble, but to take heart, for you have overcome the world. This was part of those last words that you shared with the disciples on this night, and which we'll be talking about here in just a bit. Help us to have servant hearts, Lord, and uh, just to uh, be humble, humble of, of mind and heart towards others. In your name we pray. Amen. So many of us grew up watching the TV show, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. That's my era. I don't know about you. I think my kids even got in on some of that back in the day. It first aired in 1968, a time when America was in the heat of the civil rights movement. Fred Rogers took a bold stand against casting the first African-American to have a reoccurring role on the children's TV program. Francois Clemens was singing in a Pittsburgh area church when he first met Fred Rogers. Taken by his voice, Fred asked Francois to join the cast of his new television show as a singing policeman, Officer Clemens. He would go on to play the role for 25 plus years. Initially, Clemens was, or Francois was uneasy with taking on the role of Officer Clemens, having personally had negative interactions with the police growing up and having witnessed the violence civil rights demonstrators he had faced at the hands of law enforcement. But a scene from a 1969 episode of the show helped to convince him that this role would have a positive impact on society. During the show, Mr. Rogers invited Officer Clemens to take a break from work, walking the beat, and join him in a kiddie pool to cool his feet. As the scene concludes in what is clearly a biblical gesture, Fred, who was also a Presbyterian minister, takes a towel and he dries Officer Clemens' feet for him. 25 years later, they reprise the scene during Francois' final appearance on the TV show. Fred Rogers' friendship and kindness stood in contrast to other scenes involving swimming pools in the 1960s. One particular, particular incident took place at, at a segregated pool in June of 1964 in St. Augustine, Florida. Black and white protesters staged a wade-in at the whites only pool at a place called the Monsoon Motor Lodge. As black, both black and white protesters swam in the pool together, the owner of the motel tried to force them out of the pool by throwing acid into the water. Two very different scenes and understandings of how to be in relationship with each other, even in the midst of differences. Our text for this week is interesting because it usually shows up during Holy Week, Monday, Thursday. Monday meaning mandate. Did you know that? 
Monday means mandate. Jesus said, do this, just like I am doing for you. But I like the placement here of our text, smack dab in the middle of Lent. Here we are only into week two, and our narrative lectionary has us washing stinky feet. But oh my, how I think it's so very timely with everything that's going on in our world, don't you? Right out of the shoot here in verse one, we get the whole theme of the story, love to the utmost. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to the Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he had loved them to the very end. Now, I don't know about you, but I read that first verse with new eyes as we prepare to look a little more closely at this passage. It's always one of my favorites, but this week it invites us to really enter in and slow down as we look at it apart from Monday, Thursday. We need to understand that although John's gospel sets the stage here at the table, there is no mention of the Passover meal. We do not see the Eucharistic act of bread and cup. We understand it to be present. But here in John, we are only going to see Judas eating, but not until verse 26. So go ahead and read all the way through. But here in John's gospel, this act of foot washing is central. This is what love looks and acts like. We get something else in the first 11 verses here of chapter 13. We hear Jesus knowing, knowing, three different times. And so we have to ask the question, what did he know? First, Jesus knew that his hour had come. When we hear Jesus speak of his hour, he is talking about his time of suffering, his arrest, his trial, his beating, crucifixion, and death, his hour. This marks the end of Jesus' ministry in this world, and now it was time to return to the Father. Jesus knew that his hour had come. This was it. The last time he would be with all of his disciples, and he wanted to make it count. What if you knew that your hour had come? What would you do? Two. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and that he would return from God. And so who is in complete control here? Jesus is, isn't he? At the end of the day, he knows where he came from and now where he's going. And he also knows the details in between. He knows the tough stuff. But what matters most is who he is and whose he is. Us two, who we are, but more importantly, whose we are. Number three, Jesus knew. Jesus knew who would betray him. He knew that the devil had already prompted Judas. This is not between Jesus and Judas here. This is between Jesus and Satan. Judas's heart was ripe for the picking in that moment. Greed, envy, all set in. There is this cosmic battle going on here, and Jesus is well aware. You know how sometimes you can just feel that chill or that little, the hairs stick up on your arms kind of thing? Or you just have this sense of darkness? Don't ignore that, friends. Tell Satan to flee, to buzz off in Jesus' name, and say it out loud, with power and authority of Jesus, okay? Jesus knew. Jesus knew it was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him the authority over everything, and that he had come from God, and that he would return to God. He had loved the disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them until the very end. The end means forever, to eternity. Just when we are good enough, or just, just when we 
are good enough or we, we have all of our boxes checked, but this perfect love, and Jesus says, let me show you. Let's look at the foot washing, okay? So he got up from the table. He took off his robe and he wrapped a towel around his waist and he poured the water into the basin. I love that part, don't you? I'm gonna read it again. And so he got up from the table, he took off his robe and he wrapped a towel around his waist and he poured the water into a basin. He washed his disciples' feet and he dried them with a towel. This act of foot washing was something new or it was not something new, sorry. It was not something new. Again, Jesus took a very common everyday thing and he made it holy, an object lesson of his love. We need to understand what was going on just prior to, to the supper here, okay? The disciples had been arguing about who's the greatest. You could smell the arrogance in the room. This is how the disciples stepped into this last supper with Jesus, thinking they were all that in a bag of chips. Who gets the best seat in the kingdom of heaven next to Jesus? It was the host's responsibility to provide a servant for this act of foot washing, usually done by the lowest member of the household. No free person washed feet. A slave usually did it. The supper was well underway when Jesus took the initiative. People walked everywhere in those days. What was on the ground got on the feet, which is the main reason you will not see me wear open-toed shoes in a hospital. When I first began ministry, I had a very well-meaning RN share with me that open-toed sandals were not appropriate footwear while ministering in the ER. I learned that lesson, and I have passed it on to other new clergy. The disciples' feet were dirty. They were stinky. And the tables were low to the ground, and people reclined as they ate. Your feet were very close proximity to your food. There is also reason to take a clean plate every time you go to a buffet, right? We have this picture and the reason of the foot washing. It was customary. Imagine how your feet feel after a long day and then magnify that and how good a good foot soak with maybe some nice Epsom salts feel. But the disciples bypassed the foot bath because they certainly weren't going to do it. Jesus, again, knew. He didn't forget about the foot washing. He let it go on purpose, mid-meal, right on time. He rises and he shows them what perfect love looks and acts like here. Make note of the action verbs on the part of Jesus read as you read through that. Rising, lying down, taking up, wrapping around, pouring, washing, drying. He is in complete control here. Love is in complete control over the situation, even as evil is still present in the room. Love wins. Peter, don't you just love Peter? Lord, don't touch my feet. You, can, you can't wash my feet. That's not your job. But Jesus quickly corrects him, saying, Peter, if I don't wash you, you don't belong to me. And then Peter, okay, bring it on. Do my head too. Do my arms and, and do all of my 2,000 parts. Lord, I want to have the full deal. Peter wants more cowbell. Peter wants more Jesus, more love. And we can laugh at that, but how often are we like Peter? Here is our Jesus loving us to the utmost. Jesus loves us as much as it's possible to love. And we settle for just a slice. When the offer from Christ is the full deal. This is sola sancta caritas. 
Latin, perfect love. God's perfect love. That doesn't get any better, friends. Jesus tells Peter, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash, except for his feet to be entirely clean. But not all of you are clean. You see, it's not about the water. It's about the relationship here. It's about accepting this offer of this act of love or rejecting it. And Peter is accepting. Judas is rejecting. Now this hits home for me. I don't know about you. I don't know if you have a loved one or someone you know who has rejected Christ as their personal savior, but I do. I do. Those who just flat out refuse to believe, no matter how much we can talk. This person loves me and respects what I do as pastor and believes Jesus was a nice guy and all, but refuses to wrap their head around the fact of this eternal life stuff because they just can't see it. And so I continue to pray and love on them. There are a lot of thems in our world, perhaps thems close to home in your life. We are called to these acts of love. Do this as I have done for you. Even if I just want to say sometimes, what's it going to take? You know, we don't see Judas dip his bread in the bowl as Jesus predicts until verse 26. But Judas is present. Jesus washes his feet too. Jesus offers hospitality to the one in whom will betray him. Take note of that. There is no easy answer as to why Judas betrays when he is surrounded by love, by this perfect love, why people refuse the gift God gives so freely, why evil seems to prevail when love reigns. Lord, hear our prayer. Evangelist Billy Graham has a quote. Who could disagree with the idea that we need more love in this world? We live on a planet that is torn by anger, greed, and prejudice in this world. Would certainly be a better place if we all learn to accept each other. Jesus places the disciples' needs before his own. He loved them. He loved them. These disciples needed the love of Christ to see them through the difficult times that were coming ahead. The Lord knows. We need the love of Christ these days, too. Rather than talk about the issue of firearms for teachers, when they can't afford to buy their own school supplies for their classrooms. I mean, I, I can't even fathom that. I'm not opposed to firearms. My family owns some firearms. But I wouldn't want my beautiful daughter-in-law packing a pistol alongside her lesson plan to teach each day. Do you know who does not carry a firearm in the military? A chaplain, Pastor Darrell. Chaplains in harm's way, often, yes. I understand that we need to do something in our world, but I would feel uncomfortable with teachers packing guns, for sure. Evil. Evil will always be present. We have seen that with the things that are going on in the Ukraine right now. So how do we take that down? Love. Love is what reigns in the midst of the foot washing and the meal. Love is what reigns at Jesus's hour, which is approaching. Love is what reigns in the midst of light and dark. All of these turns of the table on what's, all of this turns the tables on what society views, what a savior should look and act like. Jesus is both. Lamb of God and Lion of God. He is both teacher and Lord. The disciples never address him as Jesus. They know he is much more than that. 
They know he is not simply Mr. Rogers in a nice warm sweater that is covering up tattoos. So what can we do to abide, friends? What can we do to abide? One of my favorite words, you know that. When we simply can't love someone in the moment, Jesus knows that we can't sometimes. You know why he knows? because he's Jesus and we aren't. That's why he went to the cross. But here's what we can do. We can pray. Lord Jesus, I can't love this person right now. So I need you to love this person through me. I can't right now, but you can. And so please help me to see this person as you see them, to love this person as you love them. Perfect love. Sola Sancta Caritas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week. Jesus loves you. So do I.